Hey everybody, this is Ryan, this is Ryan McClanahan with HistoryThroughCards.com. Hope you're all doing very well today. In this video, I'm going to tell you about the 1941 Gaudi, specifically the short prints in this set and other cards that I believe are short prints. I'm going to tell you exactly why I believe that coming right up. Nineteen forty one was a pretty remarkable and historic year for baseball. I think of Ted Williams hitting four oh six for that season. The only player to come close would have been Tony Gwynn in nineteen ninety four when he hit three ninety four, though I have no doubt that he would have surpassed that mark had it not been his strike shortened season. He played in only hundred and ten games that year. And I think either the Padres or the Expos would have gone to the World Series. I think maybe if the Expos uh, did go to the World Series that year in 1994, had they actually had one, they still would have been in Montreal. And who knows? It's just uh, food for thought. But I also think of Joe DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak that year as well in 1941 which was broken by Ken Keltner of the Indians. 1941 was also a great year for collectors as well, as they had three different options available. A 72-card set commonly referred to as Play Ball, issued by Philadelphia-based Gum Inc. It remains a very popular set, and one I would recommend any novice collector wanting to get into vintage uh, go out and try to purchase. You can get a lot of those cards, the common cards, for about $20 a piece these days, or maybe even under. Then you've got the double play set issued by Gum Products, Inc. of Cambridge, Mass. And finally, a 33 card set issued by Gaudi, which would mark their final sports entry just prior to World War II, and the one we're going to discuss today. The 1941 Gaudi set consists of 33 cards with a black and white player photo set against a solid color background where each player has a yellow, blue, red, and green background card. A master set would consist of 132 cards, but I don't know of anyone who has even a basic set. And these cards are quite difficult, and I'll get into that in a little bit. These cards are notorious for being off-center and miscut, and you'll often notice this with the number which is at the bottom left corner of the card. This can be missing on a lot of these cards as well. You'll notice here, too, with these cards that it appears that each player has a row. We don't know what a full sheet looks like since it doesn't look like any exist. I've actually never seen one, and I've never heard of one either. We don't know what the printer was either. Gaudi used a third party to print their cards, such as the United States Printing and Lithograph Company in Brooklyn, and they used that company for their 1933, 34, and 1935 sets. That printing company also had a small outlet in Boston, but I highly doubt that Gaudi was using this company after 1935. There are also no known unopened packs either. Wrappers can be found, and something interesting appears on it. It suggests that the collector could obtain a Bucky Walters baseball. I've never actually seen one of these baseballs, nor would I know what to look for. Bucky Walters at the time was one of the top pitchers in the National League playing for the Cincinnati Reds, having just come off the 1940 World Series win against the Detroit Tigers. He's in the double play set, and he's also in the play ball set as well, but he's not in the Gaudi set at all. So this is kind of a strange omission. He's been nominated for Hall of Fame consideration at least once or twice in the past, and he should be in at some point, I would think. Of the 33 players in the set, only two are in the Hall of Fame, number 20, Carl Hubble, and number 33, Mel Ott. The last card in the set, actually. Most of the players in this set are not household names today, unless your household includes Al Todd, 
Bill Diedrich, or Bill Crouch. Before I get into the short prints of this set, the known short prints, I'm not at least aware of any articles or research papers on this set by our hobby pioneers. Clearly, some did research to figure out what the four cards are confirmed short printed. Was it based on sales figures? I'm not sure. If so, that would probably have been around 1978 with the first Sport Americana. In this price guide, it mentions these cards as being more difficult, albeit unattractive at the time, than the rest of the set. As you can see in this 1981 Sport Americana, commons were selling between $15 and $20 a piece, which is the 2024 equivalent of $51.74 and $69. The minimum wage in 1981 it was $3.35 an hour, or the equivalent of $11.56 in 2024. So if you take a peek at the 1941 double play and the 1941 play ball values from 1981 Sport Americana, you'll notice that both of these sets are vastly cheaper at $5.50 to $8 a piece. However, what's odd is if you look at the 1967 American card catalog, both the 1941 Gaudi and 1941 41 play ball were valued at 10 cents each, whereas the 1941 double play were t valued at 20 cents a piece. In 1967, the American card catalog didn't make any distinction between player values. On occasion, they did have included certain players in the 1909 T206. That would be the O'Hara and Demet. Uh, polar bear back cards and I believe those were valued about ten dollars a piece quite expensive in 1967 so between 1967 and 1981 someone obviously found out that there were four cards in the 1941 Gaudi set that were short printed let's look at these players and their careers up close the first player number 21 would be Harold Rabbit Worsler he was born in 1903 and passed away in 1964. Played from 1930 to September 29th, 1940 for the Philadelphia Athletics, Boston Red Sox, Boston Bees, which today you would know them as the Boston Braves or the Atlanta Braves uh, or the Milwaukee Braves. He was actually the first player that I'm aware of to arrive from Indianapolis to Boston on an airship. It's kind of neat. If you look at his stats, the one thing that's really interesting here is that he retired in 1940, or he uh, wasn't in the majors in 1940. And uh, on April 7th, 1941, he was released by the Cubs and signed by the Los Angeles Angels of the Pacific Coast League. Again, why he is uh, in this set is kind of uh, a mystery. Uh, although um, we don't exactly know when this set was uh, issued uh, or I, I would say printed. So it, it could be prior to the 1941 season. It could have very easily been printed in the uh, off season of 1940, say uh, December through February. All right, so December of 1940 through February or even March of uh, 1941. Second uh, player here I want to discuss is number 22, Joe Sullivan. And he was a pitcher for uh, Detroit Boston Bees, again, Boston Braves, Pittsburgh Pirates from 1935 to 1941. Now, he does actually have another card that I'm aware of, and it's uh, 1936 Gaudi. And by the way, I kind of forgot, Harold uh, Robert Worsler does have another card out there too, and I believe it's a 1936 National Chickle Premium. Uh, this is a, a really interesting uh, thing here because uh, in the 1981 Sport Americana, he is listed as the most expensive card in that set at $100. And uh, in 1981, 
$100 was the equivalent of $344.94 in 2024. I wouldn't suspect anybody actually going out and purchasing this card back then unless they were trying to complete the set. And I, again, I don't know if anybody has ever completed a set. I assume they probably have, uh, probably way back in like the 1970s or 80s when it was a lot cheaper. But that's the, the value here is, is relative. I looked into his stats here, and as you can see, he played four games in April of 1941, another eight games in May, four games in June of 41, and then he gets traded to the Pittsburgh Pirates. It still kind of like doesn't explain why this card would be short printed and unless the set itself was printed sometime in uh, June so uh, or May in May April May June right so around there but again uh, I, I'm gonna kind of throw that one into question uh, this third one I'm gonna talk about here is Norman Babe Young he was a first baseman for the New York Giants played one game in 1936, and then he came up again in 1939 through 1942, and he played full seasons, as you can see here. He came back from World War II in 1946, and he went from the Giants in 1947 to the Reds in 1948, and then to the Browns on July 26, 1948. A reason why I mention this is that he is on the 1949 Bowman set is actually the last card in that set. But the photo shows Bob Young, supposedly with the Yankees. I know Bob Young in the 1952 Bowman and Top set being with the Browns. And uh, Babe Young is also in the 1941 Play Ball set. It's actually quite a neat card. And he's also in the 1941 Double Play. And So there's no explanation here for his short printed card. As I mentioned before, he actually did play from April 15th to September 27th, and he had 152 games under his belt in 1941. Uh, the uh, opening season for 1941 was on April 15th. Finally, there's Stanley Polo Andrews, and uh, he was a bees catcher from uh, Lynn, Massachusetts, the city of sin. You don't go out the same way you came in. Now, I know uh, anyone from who's not from Massachusetts probably is like, what What did you just say? Well, that's uh, our our slogan here for uh, Lynn, Massachusetts, and uh, it, it kind of has stuck for decades and decades. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> uh, in 1939, he played in 13 games, and in 1940, he played 19 games, and uh he was with the Bees in spring training of 1941, but he was sent to Harford on April 4th of that year. He played in 58 games uh, altogether. Now, the one thing that I have a question about uh, regarding Stanley Andrews here is that uh, he really didn't play a whole lot. Uh, all the press, the media had said that he was a bench jockey for the majority of his career with the Boston Bees. One uh, interesting side note here, the Boston Bees. You're probably wondering, okay, well, how come they're the, they were the Braves, now they're the Bees? What happened? Well, that's because of Babe Ruth. Babe Ruth was sold in uh, 1935. He actually went to the, the Bees for the Braves uh, for an unheard of price and uh, everything was okay up until June of 1935 and then he said that Emil Fuchs double-crossed him quote-unquote and um, he he made his exit and he retired in, in June I think it was June 3rd. In comes uh, Charles Adams who was the owner of the uh, Boston Bruins and a minority owner of the Braves and he forced Emil Fuchs retirement and uh, after that, um, he actually had to vacate the uh, the presidency, if you will, the ownership of the uh, Braves, uh, because he owned Suffolk Downs. And uh, Commissioner Landis uh, said, "Listen, you can only have a you can't have both. You can only you can have a baseball club 
or you can have a racetrack, but you can't have both. And he chose uh, his racetrack. And so he had to sell the uh, Braves to Bob Quinn and they changed the name and, uh, you know, everything associated with the jersey, uh, which I thought the 1935 jersey was really cool with the Indian patch. Um, but they, uh, they went with the bees uh, motif and I believe that was gold with blue piping and it just had Boston on it and um, bees. I don't think it was ever official. So getting back to Stanley Andrews here, he came back to the majors in 1944. I think he actually may have spent some time uh, in the service, but uh, when he came back, he only got into four games with the Brooklyn Dodgers, and then he, I believe he retired. So obviously he, he wasn't getting a whole lot of uh, playing time, and again, he rode the bench. Now, the, the funny thing is, why would uh, a company bother to have him in a set like this? He's a, um, he's a Massachusetts native, and Gaudi is a Massachusetts company which is the only reason why I can think of, because he would have been like a third string catcher, maybe even fourth string. And he got into very few games during his time with the Bees. So it's kind of an interesting thing as to why this company actually uh, had some of these players uh, included in their set. You could make an argument, I think, the other two uh, card issuing companies, uh, Gum Inc. and Gum Products Inc., they could kind of like pick and choose what players they wanted, and they got the majority of the Hall of Famers at, or the stars at that time, and it left uh, Gaudi with really nothing to have. Although Mel Ott was in all three of these sets, so you do have other players who are involved in, in all three sets as well. One of the short printed players that I forgot to mention was Morris Arnovich. He's a very interesting ball player, and he was traded on December 10th, 1941, by Cincinnati to the New York Giants because the, I think the Giants were uh, really impressed with him during the uh, 1940 season in which he got into the uh, World Series that year. And so uh, he also attracted the, uh, the Jewish fans to the polo grounds. And um, they, they were looking to add uh, someone very special, and they got Morris Arnovich. However, he got maybe into a slow start in, in 1941, as it appears. He first plays in uh, April 18th, and then April 20th, and then the 30th. And then the following month, he plays on May 4th and then on May 10th and then so on. And he eventually uh, gets into 85 games uh, during the 1941 season. So it's kind of a mystery as to why he's short printed, although he went right into the military after uh, the season ended. And um, he's just a really interesting ball player. He does have a 1941 double play and a 1941 play ball, which I think is a really cool card, as you can see here. And so uh, that is uh, my uh, look into the known short prints. Now we're going to look into the, uh, the unknown short prints, or the players that I think are short printed. So here we go. So the first player that I want to talk about here as uh, unknown short prints, we'll just call it that, is Wayne Ambler. And he was with the Philadelphia Athletics from 1937 to 1939. And he does have a 1939 play ball, number 117. Now, the interesting thing is that he was a very vocal ball player. He uh, was a very funny ball player, and he had a lot of great stories that he told. I think he passed away in 2001. And one of the things he did say was that he felt after his career had ended that they might have actually brought him up too early. He probably should have stayed in the minors a year or two uh, just to get everything all sorted out. And unfortunately, he also said that he was injured uh, quite badly, in fact, 
I, I believe in 1937. Uh, so he went d directly from college into the major leagues as what it sounds like. And uh, that really kind of hurt him. He uh, got into 40 games in 1940, the uh, Jersey City Giants of the International League. And then uh, in 139 games in 1941 for the Indianapolis Indians, which was a uh, Reds affiliate. He said that he was going to be called up, except uh, that Eddie Juiced uh, got the nod over him. And I believe Wayne Ambler's uh, batting average was probably in the, the low 220s. It was not good, but then again, Eddie Juiced wasn't either. And uh, Eddie Juiced almost, um, he almost didn't make it in baseball. He, uh, he got, I think he got injured himself, but something drastic happened where he was in the minors for a while. Uh, that's, that's what happened to Wayne Ambler. And it's a reason why uh, Gowdy probably thought that he was actually going to a lock to be uh, called up to the major leagues in 1941 and early 41. And it just it never happened uh, because, again, of uh, Eddie Juiced nudging him out. And that's actually uh, something that you hear about with these older ball players too, is that they really had to fight to uh, get into the major leagues. Anyway, uh, there's another player here. He's not a short print or anything, but I do want to talk about him really briefly. Uh, Dario Lodigiani. He played one game in 1940, and he came up on September 22nd uh, of that year, so very late in the year. And uh, that's kind of interesting because Gaudi put in a player in their set who only played in uh, basically one game in 1940. There's no guarantee that he would have made it on the squad in 1941. However, he did, and he played from April 15th of 1941 to September 22nd of that year, basically an entire season. Now, what's also interesting about Dario here, uh, he lived a very long time. I think he was like 92 when he passed away, uh, but he was the mechanic on the Enola Gay during World War II. So I I never talked to him about that. I, I wish I had, actually, because uh, I, I did know him a little bit, and I did talk to him uh, over uh, the couple of years, in fact. I, I think he passed away in 2008, but I, I could be wrong. It's been a long time. So uh, the next guy that I want to talk about is Bill Crouch. And he played in six games in 1939, and in 1940, he was with the Brooklyn Affiliate. So he was in the minors, and uh, on November 12, 1940, he was involved in the Kirby Higby trade uh, with Vito Tamulius, uh, and that was a Phillies. There was a trade between those two teams. He, um, there's no crystal ball for a company to, to know what's going to happen to a player after like the season. So a, a company like Gaudi or even Play Ball or Galmank, I should say, they may have all their plans uh, ready for an upcoming set. Say in like 1940, they would have their, um, their 1941 uh, sets completed by the time that uh, opening day happens. And then you know, once opening day happens, you know, anything can happen between the off season and opening day. There may not be any rhyme or reason for some of these players to, to be actually in the set, while others it's um, a guaranteed fact that they're going to be playing the, the following season, um, unless there's an injury, of course. The next player that I want to talk about is Bob Moncrief, and he played one game in 1937, two games in 1939, 36 games uh, in 1941, and then he played through 1949 and then again in 1951. So he's kind of like all over the map, but you know, he is a study. He is also a pitcher too. And the St. Louis Browns acquired him from San Antonio of the Texas League on March 1st, 1941, after going 22 and nine. George Kaufman. So he's really interesting. 
Uh, he was acquired by the Los Angeles Angels on February 16, 1941 from the Browns. He was a pitcher and played with Detroit from 1937 to 1939 and the Browns uh, in 1940. The Angels were a Cubs affiliate. He's, again, he's kind of a, uh, a strange fit here as far as maybe the uh, card production is concerned. And then uh, Louis Chioza. Now, I know Lou Chioza because he's in the 1934 Diamond Stars set. It's a really neat-looking card, too. But he played from 1934 to 1939, and he played in 40 games for the Giants. And uh, his season ended in 1939 on July 17th, and he suffered a compound fracture. And he uh, he retired on May 21st, 1941. Now, what's really interesting here is it's kind of thought provoking, really, is that why Gowdy would have a player who hadn't seen any kind of service since 1939 uh, and include him in their 1941 set. And uh, he hadn't been playing uh, Major League Baseball or Minor League Baseball uh, since uh, his injury on July 17th of 1939. So it's it's really interesting as to why uh, they uh, chose him to be in this set. So one of these players I think is kind of uh, an oddity is Al Todd. Now he was a catcher and in 1941 he played in four games in April, the 22nd, the 26th, and the 28th and 29th. In May, he played in, and he played on May 4th and May 6th. And then the Cubs released him to Toronto. Jimmy Wilson, who was the manager of the Phillies, once said, "I wouldn't trade Al Todd for two Mickey Owens," which I think is really kind of uh, interesting. And uh, Jimmy Wilson may have been onto something because if you uh, know anything about uh, Dodgers history. Mickey Owen uh, had the pass ball of 1941, and it ruined the Dodgers' chances to win the World Series that year. And uh, it, he's really kind of a, a very famous ball player in his own right. I'm not just talking about Jimmy Wilson because he is, but um, Mickey Owen was also banned from baseball for five years for jumping to the Mexican League. So the final guy that I uh, chose to look at uh, was Chet Ross. Now, he played in 149 games in 1940, and his first game in 1941 was on May 25th versus the Giants, and he played on May 29th, May 30th, July 18th was his last game of the season. Now, I looked further into this, and he got injured during spring training, and that accounts for the May 25th call-up. And then he uh, he only plays in, I believe, 29 games during 1941, and then he's out for the entire season with an injury. And uh, he's with the Boston Bees. I thought that was really interesting, and, and obviously his injuries, uh, now they make a little bit more sense. Here are my final thoughts on the 1941 Gaudi and Gaudi as a company. So for many collectors, this set may be unpopular or unattractive, as said in the 1981 Sport Americana. A few reasons for this may be due to the fact that most of the players are your average everyday player who are either not in the majors at the time uh, or your, your common players. And uh, there's only two Hall of Famers in this set, Malouette and Carl Hubble. And another reason for its unpopularity is its simplistic design. Now, I do like the design, but I'm actually looking at it through the lens of a historian and through historical aspects, especially regarding the uh, history of the hobby. And... Uh, they're also incredibly difficult to find in high grade as well. As you can see here in PSA's population reports, uh, most of these cards are found in a PSA 5 or lower, uh, with the majority found in a PSA 4, and that would actually be 87 cards as of this video. 
There are only 2,067 cards that have been currently graded, but that actually doesn't mean that it's a rare set where these cards are rare. Uh, it really depends on certain factors, which I'm going to get into. It also may be that uh, a lot of dealers and collectors are not submitting these cards for grading, possibly due to the fact that they are kind of difficult to sell, uh, or for the reasons I just mentioned above. And uh, I also think that they may be geared toward an advanced collector. And a lot of collectors uh, may be saying, well, I don't know who the player is, so therefore I'm not going to grab the card. And uh, again, like that makes a lot of sense too. Uh, it's unfortunate, but um, you know, it, it just comes down to education as well and whether or not the collector actually wants to add uh, a semi-rare card to his collection, despite it uh, may not be as valuable as they thought. So I've discussed here a lot of the cons of collecting the 1941 Gaudi set, but what about the pros? So for me personally, when I look at these cards, I'm instantaneously uh, brought back to 1941 in my mind and thinking of what it must be like to have played a game in 1941 uh, or gone to the stadium as a fan or collected these cards as a collector in 1941. Um, obviously, like, I don't have a time-traveling flying DeLorean, but uh, if I did, you know that 1941 would have been a season that I would have gone to first. And probably Briggs Stadium or another stadium that no longer exists. Uh, maybe even Fenway Park before the Green Monster. The, uh, the players here kind of represent your average everyday ball player. And uh, if I was a, a vintage collector and wanted something rather unique for my collection, I might want to go for this set at least maybe one or two cards, despite the fact that they are actually a little more on the expensive side. Uh, it's the challenge of trying to find some of these cards, which a lot of collectors actually really like the challenge. And uh, again, if you're a vintage collector, uh, there are probably more reasons why you collect vintage than the money involved. And I, I would probably suspect, suspect that uh, history is um, kind of like a, a vital importance. Uh, but again, that's just my take on it because I'm, I'm not just looking at the card itself or the player. I'm looking at the history behind the card, how it was issued, why it was issued, who the players were, and uh, everything associated with the era in which the card was issued. So, uh, that to me is more important than the money involved. And uh, in this case, these cards are a little on the more expensive side, which may be a deterrent for collectors uh, because a lot of the players are unknown. But that actually should, um, should be something that you guys would want to maybe uh, look into. So for me, if I don't know who the player is, I'm immediately trying to find that out. I want to know who the players were. I want to know who issued the cards, where they were issued, and everything associated with it. And for me personally, though, um, again, uh, at, at this point in my collecting career, if you will, the, um, the research uh, aspect of the hobby and card collecting is um, probably greater than actually collecting the cards but again I'm only speaking for myself uh, anyway uh, so again the measurements for these cards are two and three eighths by two and seven eighths and slightly smaller than the 1941 play ball which measure at two and one half by three and one eighths and uh, those cards are actually vastly more popular with the collecting community they are beautifully lithographed color portraits and uh, they're a uh, great design as well and they have a, a great uh, star player selection so if i were a novice collector or if you're a novice collector you might want to start with the 1941 play ball um, 
the commons are actually about 15 to 20 dollars a piece now uh, compared to the 1941 Gaudis which I think can range anywhere from 25 to 50 dollars or more and I see a lot of these cards that are in the 180 range for like a one um, but that's like on the internet and on eBay so uh, at a show they may be a little bit different so I always say to you guys about uh, shows and prices you can kind of like throw the price guide away at, on the floor and that's that's usually uh, what I do and I, I always try to negotiate for a, a better price that um, I feel comfortable with and the dealer feels comfortable with as well and uh, this is one of the reasons why I always encourage you to develop a rapport with the dealer as well it may be uh, advantageous to do that so 1941 Gaudis aren't seen very often at shows either at least I generally don't see them and um, many collectors and dealers um, believe that they were printed on lesser quality stock and in lesser print runs as well and then the other two sets of the era which would be your double play by gum products inc of cambridge and a gum inks play ball of philadelphia now it's also been said that they were printed on rag stock as well i'm not entirely sure what rag stock is uh, the stock certainly is inferior to the other two cards and here i'm showing you the comparison under a microscope of the 1941 play ball and 1931 diamond stars and 1941 gaudi Now, this takes me to the health and welfare of Gaudi during the Great Depression. Uh, see if the stock of these 1941 Gaudis are that bad. It um, tells me that Gaudi as a company isn't faring so well uh, financially at this time. And uh, I don't believe that Gaudi was a financially viable company during and after 1934. And here's why. So in 1933, they went from issuing a 240 card set and uh, it ended up being 96 cards in 1934. And uh, I thought that I had heard something to where uh, the 1934 Gaudi set was actually cut short. Initially, it was suggested that Al Simmons was to have had a says series and uh, that may not be accurate. I'm not entirely sure. There's no real definitive proof that um, Al Simmons was ever contacted, though he was a client of Christy Walsh at the time, as was uh, Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth. Uh, however, uh, there's a curious copyright issue, which I'll get into in a bit. And uh, I actually wrote quite extensively on the copyright issue uh, in my look into the 1909 T206 and the 1934 Gaudi set. This is kind of interesting too. So the 1935 Gaudi has uh, 115 cards uh, in the set, though that may be a master set. I'm not entirely sure, uh, as I've heard that it consists of 36 cards and with four players on each card. That's actually 144 players. I only have maybe three of those cards in my collection. I don't really like them that much, but again, I digress here. So before his passing in 2012, Bob Lemke noticed that Gaudi's financials were headed in a yearly downward spiral after 1934 until 1942, as you can see here. Lemke apparently went through the 1965 Federal Trade Commission report in which the FTC went after Tops on Flair's behalf. Uh, to find this, 
which is really interesting to me. And why Gaudi was included is rather odd, but fantastic nonetheless. I have no doubt that these numbers are correct since they were added to the official records. The question I have, though, is who had them in 1962? So by February of 1962, Gaudi's assets were sold and its doors permanently shuttered. I believe a man named George S. Thompson was Gaudi's last president, and in 1969, a professor named John Fawcett bought numerous items from Thompson, as the story goes. Uh, in this case, uh, he had hundreds of copyright and patent cards for 1933 and 1934 Gaudi cards, sheets, and other documents. And there's nothing suggesting 1941 Gaudis were ever submitted to the Patent Office or Library of Congress. There were several copyrights by Gaudi for 1940 and 1941, but I couldn't find anything referencing the uh, 1941 Gaudi. So I, I don't think that they ever did. It doesn't appear so. Uh, I do suspect this is the reason for the limited distribution of this set, uh, probably only in the Boston area. Uh, there's nothing on these cards suggesting an advertiser either. And I doubt the printer that Gaudi used in 1933 and 1934, which was the U.S. Printing and Lithograph Company uh, based in uh, Brooklyn, had an account with the gum company in 1941. There's also no text on the backs of these cards, which is a major deterrent uh, or detractor for a lot of collectors. Uh, a, a copyright is... Um, is very necessary for the protection of your item. And there's copyrights on the um, on the wrapper of the 1941 Gaudi, but not on the cards themselves. So I actually have a question for you guys, and I would love to get an answer here. If a product doesn't have a copyright, uh, can it leave the state in which it was printed or uh, distributed, kind of? So uh, what I mean is that in the 1930s, uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of problems with uh, copyrights, and I, I am uh, I am kind of led to believe that if uh, an item didn't have a, a copyright associated with it or didn't go through the patent office, uh, where one copy would say go to uh, one copy of the card, I should say would go to Gaudi and the other copy would go to the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress does not have their copies of these Gaudi cards from 33 and 34. They said they're missing. If, uh, if you don't have the copyrights for the 1941 Gaudis, um, does that mean that they can go across uh, state lines as part of the Commerce Clause of the Constitution? I don't know the question to that. It's a, a kind of a, a theory that I have running here. So I, I'd love to get your take on that. So getting back to the economy here in Boston, uh, in the 1930s, the Great Depression really took off here in about 1934, uh, where we see George C. Miller reorganize under the bankruptcy law. Uh, they were uh, remained a viable company up until 1970. The National Chicle Company went out of business in 1937, DeLong in 1939, and by 1940, U.S. Caramel as well. I'm not entirely sure the exact date of U.S. Caramel, but I do know that I think Gum Products Inc. may have actually taken over their building uh, in 1940, and, and actually they were uh, instituted in 1940 as a company uh, under uh, uh, Harold C. D. Long as a treasurer, and uh, it, it's a really interesting set itself, and uh, a very historic set actually. Uh, you know, and a lot of collectors really don't like the double play set because it's black and white. But I did a really interesting article on Johnny Mize and his uh, his lawsuit of Gum Products Inc. in 1941 and 42. Anyway, you know, I can only assume um, what happened to Uncle Jack's candy as well. 
and that's a, a candy company from Massachusetts and Rhode Island. And I, I can assume that it, uh, it went out of business in the Great Depression as well. So guys, I'm, I'm going to leave it here for now. I'd love to get your take on this uh, set and Gaudi in general. If you have any favorite cards from this set, I'd love to hear what you have in your collections or hear your stories about collecting Gaudis. I'm probably going to revisit this in the future because I really want to dive into the 1962 Federal Trade Commission report, which is a 112-page report. And I know it's quite long, but uh, Gaudi's name is in it uh, several times, and I'd like to know exactly why, because by 1962, Gaudi was not a company anymore, uh, by February, in fact. And uh, the report itself uh was issued in 1965 which means that um according to the report that flair or the federal trade commission uh, uh on flair's behalf uh, started a lawsuit against tops in 1962 and that is a huge huge piece of hobby history that really needs to be studied and talked about further but i also think that gaudi is really important, especially to our hobby pioneers, because many of those guys uh, really kind of made their teeth with this set, or not exactly the 41, but with Gaudi in general, and specifically 1933 Gaudi, which I did a very lengthy article on. And so guys, I'm going to leave it there for now, but I would love to hear what you guys have to say uh, in the comment section below. Give me a like and subscribe. If you want more con content like this, and if you like what you hear now, uh, don't worry, I will have more in the future. Have a good one. Bye.